Hi, my name's Kevin Hicks. Welcome to my YouTube channel, The History Squad. Now, today's video is a continuation of our Hundred Years' War series, the Battle of Najera, or Najera if you're English. Now, this is a complete series that we're doing, the Hundred Years' War, so if you've missed any of the episodes or you've not seen any, there is a, a link to the playlist in the description here. Now, the Battle of Najera, 3rd of April, 1367. It's really a battle with English, German, French, Spanish mercenaries, all jumbled up. It's a heck of a battle, but it should never have taken place. You see, although this is part of the Hundred Years' War as we know it, and I hate this, the Hundred Years' War, that was only coined in the 19th century by historians. This is actually a war between Edward of England and John, King of France. And it's over. There is a peace. The Treaty of Bretigny, uh, 1360, it was signed and it gives Edward III what he was looking for all the time was his autonomous rule over his own lands in France. He no longer has to pay homage, kneel down with his sword to the King of France. That is done. The treaty is signed. There is peace. England is thriving. France can now recover because it's been going through hell. Now it can recover. Unfortunately, though, John the Good, King of France, John II, dies. And it's sad because while he was in captivity in England, Edward III and he got on like a house on fire. They became friends. So this is a really good treaty, although it leans a little bit better for the English. It is a treaty and there is peace. And then John, unfortunately, John the Good dies. His son, Charles V, takes over. And this is where it goes awry. It's always the next lot, isn't it? The next king, the next prince. They've always got to make their mark. And it's sad because now Castile, this kingdom of northern uh, Spain, has a navy. And it's an incredibly powerful navy, far more powerful than anything the French have got and anything the English have got. And what Charles V of France has an eye on is becoming friends with this kingdom of Castile and therefore having the navy on his side. Why didn't he just leave it alone? Because what happens now, it's a disaster really, and it will lead to so many decades of war. So before we go into this, I need to introduce you to the players in our game here because it's quite complicated. So here is Pedro. Pedro I of Castile. He is the King of Castile. He is favoured and supported by Edward III of England. So I'm going to move him down here a little bit. And uh, Henry of Trastamara. He becomes Henry II of Castile when he usurps Pedro with the help of Bertrand de Gesselin, the Constable of France, who is supported, of course, by Charles V of France. So, Edward III now takes the side of Pedro, but they're not going to be engaged in fighting the French direct. And he sends his son, Edward, Prince of Wales, to put Pedro back on the throne. Straightforward, isn't it? But there's one problem for Edward, Prince of Wales, who is commonly known nowadays as the Black Prince. He's got to take his army over the Pyrenees mountain range, which is in the territory of Navarre. He's got to go through the Pass of Roncesvalles. Now, the French have already got a treaty in place with Charles II of Navarre to block the pass. So the English cannot pass through. So the Prince of Wales sends an invading army, just a small force, into Navarre uh, to remind them that they best open the pass or otherwise he'll invade their country. The pass is opened. Edward's army crosses the Pyrenees. This is interesting because some of these routes that have been taken were taken time and time again during the Napoleonic Wars by English armies. So this is, this is quite something. Now, Edward, having crossed the Pyrenees, enters the kingdom of Castile. He crosses the river Evro at Lugorno and heads straight for the village of Navarrete. This is going straight towards the usurper's army, Henry. He's got a big problem because he's been warned by the king of France 
Charles V. Don't have a head-on battle with the English, but the English are coming straight for him. He cannot avoid battle. Now, his strong card is he has Bertram de Gessin, the constable of France's army, with him. So he's got quite a backbone there. The rest of his army, mercenaries and locals too. So he's going to make a stand. And I've actually made a model just to explain what happens because as the English come towards him, he forms his army into battle, ready to receive the English. There are two big hills, so the English are going to come through the pass, if you like. Uh, and then the English don't. Edward, Prince of Wales, performs the most brilliant manoeuvre. He actually turns his entire army in battle formation to the right and they go round one of the hills outflanking Henry's army. They're going to hit them in the left. So Henry has to manoeuvre his army round to the left. He succeeds with the first part of his army and the second part of the army is in chaos. And I've made a model to show you the right flank of what happens to Henry's army. Now, Edward's army supporting Pedro had anything up to 7,000 men. They were facing Henry with the Gessalans army of around 6,000 men. So what I've done with my model, trying to explain this very complicated battle, is we have the one hill here, and then further back would have been another hill. The English would have approached down this way, but the prince does that incredible manoeuvre where he turns his army to his right and he comes around the hill. So this is the English army here. This is on their extreme left flank. Obviously, I can't do the entire battle. Meanwhile, the second wave of Henry's cavalry charge. But he doesn't look behind him. As they've done the manoeuvre to turn to face the English, the rear part of his army is in chaos. They haven't done it at all well. And many of them now, and I've shown it, simply run away. They run all the way round the hill and they join the back of Edward's or Pedro's army, if you like. They've changed sides. Meanwhile, the cavalry come in. The cavalry have been warned by Gesselin, don't charge on horse. The bowmen will cut you to pieces. But they ignored him. These arrogant knights, it's beneath us to fight on foot. So they charge. Both types of cavalry, heavily armoured horses as well as the light cavalry with no armour. And they literally were cut to pieces. And as they clash in, at first success, they push the English centre back. But then the bowmen begin to wreak havoc, shooting straight into those poor horses. Many of the wounded horses now charge back, smash into the charging cavalry. There is chaos an absolute slaughter. Eventually, those that can escape simply ride off the battlefield. This leaves Gesselin with his second wave alone. There's nobody to back him up. The English army now is free on both flanks, both wings, to simply surround him and annihilate his force. Gesselin himself is captured, but his force is pretty much annihilated. What the Prince of Wales does now, he doesn't sit on his laurels, he sends his light cavalry to pursue those who've left the battlefield and they catch thousands of them. Henry's army, if you like, is pretty much slaughtered. Now, I've heard one quote that this was a more prestigious victory for Edward, Prince of Wales, than the Battle of Poitiers. So it shows you is this major defeat that was inflicted on Henry's army. But Henry escapes. He does that wonderful thing. He gets back to where his squire is, holding a particular kind of horse, a courser. He gets on it and escapes through to France. And it's here that Edward, Prince of Wales, on learning that Henry's escape, says that oh, it's a failure then. It's all to nothing. They needed to capture Henry, put him down. This entire campaign had cost Edward, Prince of Wales, a fortune. Now, Pedro, once he's put back on the throne, is supposed to pay back this enormous debt, but he reneges on the agreement, this Pedro the Cruel. He wanted to kill every one of the prisoners, including Gesselin, but the Prince of Wales stopped him. He did apparently execute some, even one with, by his own sword, but the Gesselin was saved by 
Edward, Prince of Wales, which I think was a bit of a mistake because de Gesselin, what a soldier. We'll learn more about him in, in other films. Now, what happens in the aftermath? Edward goes back to his holdings in France and he's got to um, impose some terrible, terrible taxes on his people to pay the soldiers, to pay for this campaign. And they now complain and they turn to the King of France and he steps in. Oh my goodness me, he should not have done. This was an English business in their own holdings in France. Meanwhile, Edward, Prince of Wales, falls ill. He has dysentery. Well, I hope you enjoyed my video. I will tell you now, it did my head in. This is such a complicated campaign, battle, the whole business. So with my model, I've tried to simplify it for us. And if you did enjoy it, well, like, share and subscribe. And don't forget to turn on the all notification button so you know what's coming on down the line. And finally, a quick shout out to my Patreon members, Michael Briggs, Joe Newkins and Ian Tomlinson. Thanks a million, guys.